We're continuing our study this morning on the end times. Uh, so it's, uh, we're centered in the book of Revelation for most of the study, but uh, uh, Carl Lehman took us into the book of Daniel to look at Daniel's 70 weeks, and we're, we're looking a little wider than just the book of Revelation here. Um, for just continuity with what's gone before, we've really been, uh, the, most of the speakers have presented most of the thoughts here from a uh, pre-tribulational and pre-millennial perspective. Uh, just for review, pre-tribulational, that's referring to when the church is caught up or raptured to be with Christ in the air from 1 Thessalonians 4. So that event would be uh, right about at the beginning of Dwayne Gertner's first message, if you're following along through the series here, prior to the whole tribulation and the uh, judgments of God being poured out. And then premillennial would refer to when Christ returns to the earth. That happened really during uh, Kevin's message last week when uh, the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven and comes and uh, uh, the events unfold there. Just for continuity uh, here too, we'll uh, just, just kind of look back at Revelation 19. I'm doing Revelation chapter 20 today. Uh, key events in that are the millennial kingdom and the great white throne. And uh, I thought, you know, the, the, we have to cover a thousand years this morning. Uh, Peter said in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, with the Lord, a thousand years is as a day, and a day is as a thousand years. But uh, I will try to make sure that a thousand years is about 30 minutes this morning, so that we, uh, I don't get into trouble here. But uh, just, uh, again, looking back into Revelation 19, uh, there, there's actually a... Uh, uh, openings in the book of Revelation, if you study the literary structure throughout, that uh, help to frame certain sequences of events. And one in uh, Revelation 19.11 is this, and I saw heaven opened. And when heaven is opened, the one who is revealed is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's revealed as uh, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and the Word of God, and he comes arrayed for battle uh, with a, a, a two-edged sword protruding from his mouth, and he returns to the earth uh, with the armies of heaven accompanying him, it says. It doesn't say exactly who constitutes that army, but they're all astride white horses and dressed in white linen. And, but it's the Lord Jesus himself with the sword coming from his mouth who slays all those who are opposed to him on the earth. And so the, uh, the two kind of key things that happen as a result of that battle of Armageddon uh, the beast and the false prophet who are introduced earlier uh, during the tribulation period uh, are sent to the lake of fire. And uh, all of mankind that opposed him uh, end up being in the bellies of the birds. There's a, uh, a, a call to all the birds of the air to come and feast on the flesh of horses and of uh, uh, men both great and small. And I think Kevin mentioned feeling quite encouraged from his study in the book of uh, Revelation in chapter 19, so I'm not sure quite how that follows from that, but nonetheless, we're left at the end of chapter 19 with the birds being uh, sated on the flesh of all those who had been slain by the Lord Jesus. So we pick it up at the uh, start of Revelation 20. Uh, Revelation 20 breaks down, actually, uh, I think for there's kind of four... Uh, distinct thought units, if you will, in that. So what I'm going to do this morning is just kind of read uh, each of those four small chunks, and then we'll look at each one individually as we go through that, rather than reading through the whole thing. Uh, Revelation 20, verse 1 says this. This is events on earth continuing here. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. So once the, uh, the birds are satisfied, an angel comes down from heaven, it says, with the key of the abyss. You might recall in Revelation chapter 1, uh, the Lord Jesus himself mentions having the keys of death and Hades. So the notion here, I think, being that these things are all under the ultimate authority of God. But the angel comes down with the key to the abyss, and the, uh, the idea of the abyss in Scripture seems to be a, uh, a place where uh, demonic forces, spiritual forces, can be confined. Uh, in uh, the uh, uh, 
uh, story of the, the uh, man uh, uh, in the tombs uh, in, uh, in the land of the Gadarenes. Uh, as Jesus encounters him, and uh, he gets the idea that Jesus is going to make him leave that man. Uh, uh, the demons who were possessing him say they were employing, imploring him, this is Luke chapter 8, they were imploring him not to command them to go away into the abyss. So in that pericope, actually, the demons themselves who are uh, inhabiting this man were aware of this uh, place, the abyss, and didn't want Jesus to send them there. So he, he sent them into a bunch of pigs instead, actually. But uh, this is the place that's mentioned here in Revelation where Satan himself is going to be confined. And I suppose, the text doesn't say it, but uh, that the implication is not just Satan personally, but but all his minions, right? Satan is not going to be able to be an influence to deceive on the earth for this period of 1,000 years. And then this is the first mention that we have of this uh, 1,000 years, 1,000 years. That uh, term or that, that idea is going to recur in the next uh, six verses, in verses 2 through 7. Each one of them mentions the 1,000 years. And that's where we get this idea of a millennial kingdom or a millennium. It's really just from here. There's no other place in scripture that points us to a particular period of 1,000 years, but that's what's actually stated directly here in Revelation and defined. Um, so, so that's where we get that notion from. And uh, the first thing that we can take away for this 1,000 years, you know, there's, there's three, uh, uh, traditionally we think of three adversaries of mankind that they're really dealing with in this world. Uh, the world itself being the world systems, its government systems, its cultures, all these things that would uh, distort the teachings of God and have their own agenda. The world, the flesh, our own sinful natures, and the devil. So you see that one of them right here at the beginning of this millennium, this thousand years, is completely taken out of the way. Satan is confined to the abyss and can't be an influence anymore on people on the earth. So going forward here then to... Uh, uh, chapter 20 and verse 4, uh, we'll read a little bit more. Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus, and because of the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life, and reigned with Christ, for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Let's get a sip of water here. <coughs> So, there is a lot in those three verses. Uh, first thing is mentioned is that there, he saw thrones. You know, the notion of thrones is governmental authorities. Kingdoms are associated with thrones, right? And uh, interestingly, you know, in, uh, uh, even in the eternal state that uh, Mark, or I think it's Carlotta here in the bulletin. Has. I, I must, I'm assuming that means you, it's not a distant relative. But, uh, Mark's going to take up the eternal uh, state next week at the end of Revelation. But even there, there's a recognition of nations. Apparently, you know, they, having national identities persists even into the eternal kingdom. And certainly here there's this notion of thrones, that there's individual principalities, as it were, or there's governmental authorities that are given, uh, ruling in those jurisdictions. Uh, but all of them are reigning with Christ at that point. So these, the people who are actually occupying these thrones are particularly mentioned here. Uh, they're people who, uh, during this time of the tribulation, uh, they were beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus. Uh, people who suffered death because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. It mentions also those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hands. So things that they did do, they were faithful to Christ and their testimony and things they withheld themselves from. They didn't capitulate to the Antichrist forces that were arrayed. And, you know, they were a faithful minority in that day and ultimately suffered death on account of it. Uh, you know, which is, if you think of 
you know, people even today who are going through similar persecution in places in the world. It is real, it's not just imaginary, it's not just a story. But one of the things that's portrayed here is that those people ultimately who suffered so much for their faithfulness to Jesus Christ, well, there is a reward here, isn't there? Now they're raised to life again, resurrected, and reigning with him, alongside of him. How great a picture is that of the goodness of our God ultimately? Not always that we see necessarily in the circumstances that happen to us as we're faithful to him here, but ultimately what the end of that is. So that's the people pictured reigning with him here. You know, it doesn't say, um, you know, that particularly it says here people who had not uh, worshipped the beast or received his mark. You know, that seems to point us to people who were faithful to Christ specifically during this uh, preceding seven years, this tribulation period. It doesn't say explicitly right here that the church, which if you're keeping track now, was actually resurrected and caught up to be with Christ prior to the tribulation period. That's that pre-tribulation view. It doesn't say specifically that they are part of this group that's reigning with Christ on earth. Uh, by extension, however, you might know, you know, these people are, again, people who are faithful to Jesus Christ, who are believers during this period. Um, it, it's not a leap to suspect that all of the Lord's people are returned with him. Again, you know, when we see the Lord Jesus return to the earth here, it doesn't mention the church specifically being with him. It just mentions the armies of heaven. But uh, so there's, there, it's open to interpretation and to speculation. But nonetheless, I think uh, certainly a lot of people that hold to this premillennial, uh, pre-tribulational view expect that the church themselves will be part of those faithful in Christ who are reigning at this time. So that might be you and me, brothers and sisters, reigning together with him. A uh, few, few ideas that are introduced here, too, that are really significant. One is, you know, here we see the, these people who it says came to life, they're resurrected. Uh, and it says the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years are completed. We'll get to that in a couple of verses. But it says this is the first resurrection. If you're keeping track, I just wait, I just said that the church was resurrected and caught up to be together with the Lord seven years ago, right? So isn't this the second resurrection? I'm, well, the, uh, I think the sense of this is actually something that's enunciated by the Lord Jesus himself during his earthly ministry. In uh, John chapter 5, uh, verse 28, the Lord says this, Do not marvel at this. For an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth. Those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life. Those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. So two different resurrections, one to life and one to judgment. And the Apostle Paul actually, as he makes his defense before Felix in Acts chapter 24, really enunciates the same idea. Here he says, but this I admit to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I do serve the God of our fathers, believing everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets, having a hope in God which these men cherish themselves, that there shall certainly be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So this notion of two resurrections here is something that the Apostle Paul is saying, you know, I base this on the law and the prophets. This isn't something that just got introduced in the last few years. This isn't a new teaching, but this is a hope that we cherish based upon the law and the prophets. And the Lord Jesus' words in particular stand out, don't they? Not just that there's a resurrection of both people, but one is a resurrection to life and the other a resurrection to judgment. So I think the notion here of the first resurrection is that resurrection to life it may not be all happening at the same time, but just as the resurrection of the church is a resurrection to life uh, at the beginning of the tribulational period, so here too, those who were slain, who suffered for Christ during the tribulation are pictured as part of this first resurrection to life, as opposed to a resurrection to judgment. And it says particularly here, uh, this is the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. So that's another th idea that's just introduced here, really, for the first time in resurrection of a second death. Even these people who are, in, um, who are reigning with Christ, who are in the tribulation, who are raised to life, they've already died, haven't they? 
just as all the, the saints, well, I shouldn't say all the saints, most of the saints who are caught up to be with the Lord Jesus uh, are those who died too. Those, those who were there are, are caught up last. So there were some people that, uh, that never actually died, but they were all changed. But nonetheless, the, uh, the notion is that they, most of those have already died a mortal death. Their mortal life has come to an end. But here, the author points out that there is a second death, that if you're part of that first resurrection, you won't experience. We'll get to that in just a little bit. Uh, so, overview of what's going on here, though. So now, the world system, uh, its, its governments, its agendas, its culture, has been replaced. Now the ruling authority on earth is Jesus Christ and his faithful redeemed people that he's put into place in these institutions to oversee the entire earth. So now Satan is taken out of the way and the world in that sense is taken out of the way. And what we're left with then is the adversary of man is our, our own sinful nature. That hasn't been taken away. Uh, one uh, question that uh, reasonably comes up here is who is it that is being ruled at this time? Uh, if the, everybody is wiped out uh, during the Battle of Armageddon, then there's nobody left to be ruled, right? Well, the, uh, what's postulated is that everybody isn't wiped out at the end of the Battle of Armageddon, uh, that there are faithful mortal people who are left uh, who actually survived that. Uh, although the book of Revelation does not explicitly say that. One of the things we're going to be getting into, and I'll try to explain a little bit, is there is a lot of uh, speculation based on other verses in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, if you hold to a dispensational premillennial view. A lot of stuff gets imported from other places in the scriptures. Revelation doesn't really tell us uh, that there are people who survive that are part of what's being, uh, that are, are being reigned over here. So, uh, by implication and consistent with, again, this, you know, the typical associations of this pre tribulation or pre millennial view, the idea is that there were people that survived the tribulation who are part of that now, small in number uh, at the outset of this time. One of the implications of that, too, by the way, an implication of any old. Any premillennial view, whether it's uh, dispensational or not, is that there are resurrected, glorified people on the earth at the same time that there are now mortal people on the earth who are being reigned over. Uh, make of that what you will, but that's an inescapable implication if you look at it in that light. <coughs> Moving ahead, uh, the millennial kingdom. So this is. You know, this idea, of the, the verses we've just read are really all the verses that tell us about the millennial kingdom in Revelation. We've just covered all of it. So, uh, it's, well, okay, it's a thousand years and saints are reigning with them, and then it's going to end in just a minute, and in verse 7 we'll get on to that. But uh, that's not all that people associate with uh, the millennial kingdom by any means. Uh, most of that comes from uh, what I mentioned, this dispensational uh, premillennial view, which is not the same thing as premillennialism. So this is starting to sound like a college class, right? There's all these terms to discuss. Let me break out for you just briefly a little bit about uh, the significance of this. And I do this really because uh, a prevailing view in a lot of the assemblies is this dispensational view. I think it's helpful to understand where this comes from. Uh, it's because it's certainly not something you're reading in Revelation. We've already read that, and none of this is mentioned whatsoever. So, uh, dispensational theology, uh, inaugurated about 1830 by a fellow named John Nelson Darby. Uh, and the, uh, it's been advanced over the years. Uh, C.I. Schofield of Schofield Reference Bible fame was very much a, a proponent of that. Uh, Harry Ironside in the earlier part of the last century uh, was as well. I wrote books on that. There's a succession of theologians at Dallas Theological Seminary, as Dallas is really institutionally very much an upholder of this dispensational view. Uh, uh, names like Lewis Perry Schaefer and uh, Charles Ryrie and John Walvard, a couple of them presidents of the institution, past presidents of the institution, very much were people who were advancing and developing these notions of dispensational theology. It is principally an approach to determining how Old Testament prophecies 
uh, that they don't believe have been uh, fulfilled yet in a very literal sense That's, that goes along with this view, especially those concerning the nation of Israel can be fulfilled. Where do they fit into the New Testament? Where are they going to be fulfilled later on in time? Uh, just a couple quotes to give you a little bit of that flavor of this from some of these people. John Walford uh, stated in a, a paper he wrote years ago, dispensational premillennialism is founded principally on interpretation of the Old Testament. Okay, looking at the Old Testament scriptures and anticipating things that haven't been fulfilled yet. Uh, Herman Hoyt, another dispensationalist, wrote, little is said in the New Testament about the vast changes that will occur in this realm. It is in the Millennial Kingdom. These must be found in Old Testament prophecy. Um, Charles Ryrie wrote, All other views bring the church into Israel's fulfilled prophecies except dispensationalism. That's kind of key, too, because dispensationalism makes a very strong distinction between the church as not part of uh, what God is intended to uh, is intending to fulfill his program. I think we uh, looked at Daniel's 70 weeks uh, and, you know, the, the notion with dispensationalism is that the end of Daniel's 69th, these are weeks of years, seven. So after 69 periods of seven years, Messiah was cut off. If you follow the Jewish prophetic calendar of 360 days per year, the math all works out. And that's when the Lord Jesus is crucified. And then everything stops. The 70th week is out somewhere in the distance to be fulfilled. But what lies between the 69th and the 70th week is the church age, uh, something that Harry Ironside called the great parenthesis, as though it's a, a large interruption in God's progress through these things that ultimately is to fulfill these Old Testament prophecies for Israel. So uh, th that's the flavor of this dispensational uh, theology, is looking at the Old Testament and what hasn't been done yet in the view of the people who are analyzing it, uh, and where must it fit in the future. Well, uh, especially because many of those prophecies are of things that would happen on earth, they look to the millennial kingdom where the Christ returns to the earth and is there as where these things would be fulfilled. A few bullets on the things from the Old Testament then that are, are imported there. Uh, Christ as king will sit on a material throne and will rule over the entire earth. Israel will rule over the Gentile nations. Uh, the, again, the primacy of Israel over all others. Primacy of Jerusalem and the vicinity as well, the holy city. The Genesis curse will be lifted in part. Retribution against anyone violating the law will be swift and harsh. The notion of being ruled with a rod of iron. Absence of war and universal peace. Material prosperity. Minimal disease and physical health are the norm. World population will be small at the beginning, but will rapidly grow. Changes will occur on the face of the earth at the beginning, such as the division of the Mount of Olives in uh, Zechariah 14. Jerusalem is seemingly elevated to a high plateau, also in Zechariah 14, and the rest of the land is depressed. Uh, there will be a temple and temple sacrifices uh, from Ezekiel's chapter 40 to 48. Yearly pilgrimages to Jerusalem will be required and Jewish feast days are reinstituted. You get a little, uh, John uh, Walbert uh, mentions in one of his studies that uh, he believes there's hundreds of Old Testament prophecies that await fulfillment in this millennial period when this kingdom is set up. So that gives you at least just a little bit of the, a sense of where some of this stuff comes from. It's really based on that outlook. It does not state it in Revelation. In fact, if all of this is going to be fulfilled in the millennium, it is darn strange that none of it is mentioned in the verses we just read in the book of Revelation. It's systematic theology, trying to look at all the parts of Scripture and see how they may fit together. Um, I mentioned that, like I said, by virtue of, we've been really looking at this whole end times idea from this standpoint, not just a pre-tribulational and pre-millennial, but also really dispensational premillennialism. And this is the expectation that people have who are holding to that view. I am not espousing it myself, but just trying to kind of keep it all in context and give you an idea where some of that comes from. Uh, moving ahead then uh, to verse seven, when the thousand years are completed. So they're over already and I still have a few minutes to go. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. This is verse seven of Revelation 20. 
and it will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So just like that, a thousand years has gone by. And Satan is released from his imprisonment uh, and goes forth again to do what he did before, to deceive the nations. And seemingly in the text here, in a short period of time, he is able to gather to himself from the four corners of the earth. It's not like there's just one group of people in one place. This is from all over. He's able to gather to himself an enormous army of people uh, to go against the Lord Jesus. You know, that uh, it says they're as numerous as the sand of the seashore. It doesn't say exactly what the size of it is, but uh, just an enormously large army. And you think about what is implied in that. For a thousand years, the Lord Jesus himself has been reigning on earth. You know, we know the character of God. I, I, I think maybe some of the things from the Old Testament, you know, give a portrayal of, like, you know, being ruled with a rod of iron, that, that it's all harshness and, and tyrannical. We know the character of God, and that's not all there is to it. I think his love, his benevolence, his provision, all those things must be in evidence as he is reigning, for they are all part of who he is. And people have been living under this rule of his, this reign of his for a thousand years. And yet, even in the midst of that, it seems that there's some people who really don't want him to be the one who rules over them. You know, I'm uh, uh, in Luke chapter 19, the parable is told of... Uh, uh, the minus, the ten minus. Uh, and and that, that parable kind of has two interwoven sections. One is that the, the, uh, the ruler, the Lord, is going to go away and he leaves his servants in, uh, in care of this money of his uh, to do with, to invest as they would. But, uh, but it also says in there, there's another subtext going on. Uh, Luke 19, 14 says this, But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to reign over. And that seems to be what's happened here during this thousand years, is that even in the midst of the Lord Jesus himself reigning on earth, Satan being taken out of the way, so, so that deception not being part of what influences them, they still in themselves come to a point where they do not want Jesus to be the person that reigns over them. In Luke chapter 19, you know, again, you, know, you go farther on in that parable, and you know the 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 Lord returns and uh, rewards his servants for how they've handled those minds. But he says at the end, but these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. Harsh words, aren't they? But nonetheless, that's what happens at the end of this millennial period. You know, the Lord Jesus has been reigning on earth. He's taken these other things out of the way, but just what's in the hearts of man is sufficient for Satan to easily gather to himself an enormous army to come not just against the holy city, but against the one who's ruling from there, the Lord Jesus himself. You know, and this time what we see is not what's portrayed in various ways uh, earlier in the book of Revelation, even the, in the battle of Armageddon, a, a giant army coming from heaven. Now, just superior firepower. Fire comes down from heaven and consumes them all, and that's it. Really, God's final judgment on mankind's opposition against him. And it's swift and it's complete, and there is nothing left. But when you think about what that was really about, it was that ultimately there is a contingent of people who simply did not want him to reign over them. Likewise, of course, Satan has no interest in God reigning over him. And finally, Satan now is not just imprisoned as he had been for the prior thousand years but he's cast into the lake of fire. This is really God's final judgment uh, also on Satan himself. Uh, his days of being an influence anywhere have come to an end. Uh, and it says specifically here of the beast and the false prophet and Satan himself. Uh, 
They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So they, this is not death. This is not being consumed. This is not simply their end of existence, uh, but their end as far as where they will always be and what they will always experience, which again really seems unimaginable in the sense, doesn't it? It's hard for us knowing the love of God in our own lives. It's hard for me anyway to picture that this is what he's ultimately set up as what they really need is eternal torment. But nonetheless, the text is really unequivocal in that too, isn't it? That that's God's final judgment on the beast and the false prophet and Satan himself here. So we've come to a couple of final judgments here. His final judgment on the earth of all those who had opposed him, all the, of mankind who opposed him, and his final judgment of Satan. But there's yet another judgment uh, to come here in Revelation 20. Verse 11, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books, according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So, another throne appears here. But this throne, the great white throne, uh, this isn't on earth. It says, it, you know, it's interesting language that's used here uh, from him whose presence earth and heaven fled away. Uh, that they're, they're out of sight right now. I, I think uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter writes, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. You might think, well, maybe that's, you know, this, this is where that's fulfilled, but I, I think there's some complications, honestly, in the text, because one, you know, the, uh, the earth, if it's, if it's all consumed and destroyed, uh, you know, how does the sea, which is part of the earth, give up the dead that are in it? And even, you know, Hades is always a place that is pictured, you know, the place of repose of the dead, Sheol in the Old Testament, uh, you know, updated to be Hades in the New, but uh, this place of the dead that is still seen as being on earth, not away from the earth. Uh, if the earth is just simply destroyed and gone, not clear how uh, it is that uh, there's a sea or a Hades where the, the dead would be brought from. So uh, not sure exactly how we ought to inter interpret the symbolic language there, but what Revelation actually says itself is just that the heavens and the earth are, are not in view at, our, at, at all at this point in time as this judgment goes forward. We, we certainly can take that from verse 11. Uh, heaven and earth have fled away. And before this throne then stand all the people who are resurrected. They were not part of the first resurrection. They're part of the second resurrection. And over them, the second death does have power. That's what's going on right here. And, and how does this unfold? This is then God's judicial judgment here now uh, on the sin of mankind. Well, it says the judgment takes place according to their deeds. They're all recorded. You know, it's shown here as books being written. But, but you know, we, we think maybe God has forgotten some of these things, right? Maybe all of this hasn't been accounted for. That's not what's portrayed here, certainly, in this scene. But that all of people's deeds have been accounted for, written down here, as it were. And what they're doing is they're standing before the Lord now to be accountable for what they have done. A very reasonable thing to do, isn't it? All of us, by the way, are going to stand before the Lord, before his bima, to account for the things that we've done even as believers. Uh, accountability for our lives is not something that is taken away in Christ. But this judgment is. This judgment is. These people, though, there's another book that they check. The book of life, to see if their names are there. You know, the Lord Jesus really makes reference to this idea in Luke chapter 10, verse 19. 
he had sent his disciples out with, with uh, a spiritual power to continue the work of the kingdom. He says, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. You know, similarly, you know, that's, that doesn't say book of life specifically, but your names are recorded in heaven. Rejoice in that. The Apostle Paul, as he writes in, uh, to the Philippians, says, uh, at the end of the book, Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. How precious is it to have your name in the book of life? But I think the presumption here is that all these people who are part of the second resurrection you know, they, if, if their names were in the book of life, they should have been part of the first resurrection, right? The book is checked, but yeah, your name is not there. Think about what that means. You know, the Lord Jesus, 2,000 years ago, came and offered himself on the cross at Calvary to bear my sin and yours, to wake a way that we could be reconciled to God in him and have eternal life taking our judgment upon himself and offering us instead life eternal. And he holds out that offer. You know, uh, uh, Peter, I mentioned 2 Peter chapter 3 a couple of times. He says, you know, why is it that God is taking so long? It seems to be the implicit question people are asking Peter. He says, the Lord isn't slow as you think of slowness, but he's, he's patient with us, not wanting any to perish. And so for, for all these years, he's waited. And even through the this period of the millennium. There he is reigning. He's taken all these things out of the way. And still, people are in rebellion to him. There does come an end where there isn't another opportunity. There does come an end to all of this. Is, is God going to somehow let into the eternal state we'll look at next week? Is, is he Leaning in such that, you know, I, I know you're a, a terrible sinner and this is just going to infect everything in the eternal state, but darn it, I, I just have to let you in anyway. No, he doesn't. He will cut that off. The choice that each one of us has to make in that, though, is, will we have this man to reign over us? Do we want to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and accept the goodness of everything that he holds out to us? These people have not that are pictured here. Their names are not in the book of life. And so they, they bear the judgment in themselves for all that they've done according to the flesh. And their end is the lake of fire, the same place that the beast and the false prophet and Satan go. You know, one thing that's not mentioned here is what type of body they receive in the, this second resurrection. I would like to think that, uh, you know, it's not just a glorified body that goes on eternally, perhaps, it's termed the second death. Maybe they are consumed. I don't know. Maybe the mercy of God is still in evidence even in that. But certainly, they do not have eternal life with him forever, as we anticipate in Jesus Christ. Their names are not in the book of life. Well, that's a pretty discouraging note to end on. So let me take just a minute to add one more. A different throne. You know, there the, the great white throne is where people whose names are not in the book of life are judged. And that's going to occur someday in the future, at least, a th at least a thousand years from today, right? Here's a different throne that's portrayed, though, in the book of Hebrews. This is Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. If you have your name written in the book of life, this applies to you. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens... Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Beloved, that's a throne 
If you receive Christ by faith, it stands open for you today and he bids us to come confidently to him at that throne, that he might minister to us. How good is that? I'd much rather come to that throne than the one that's pictured in Revelation 20. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your mercy to us through your Son. We thank you that those of us who have trusted in him, who have come to him by faith, and that's something that you have enabled us to do. Our names are in the book of life, that we can come confidently to the throne of grace this morning, Father, to receive help from one who sympathizes with us in our weaknesses, who is made like us. But after we've looked this morning also at uh, Revelation 20 to see what the end is of those who have not. Father, that their end is the second death, their end is destruction. And that's a sobering thought, Father. And just now we think of perhaps many people that we know, co-workers and family members, loved ones, who have not trusted in Christ, Father. Certainly we beseech you on their behalf that even this day you might turn their hearts toward yourself, that they might trust in Christ and have their names written in the book of life. Father, help us as we take in all these things, very large things about the end times, uh, sobering things. But help us in the midst of all that, Father, to see you and your Son, our Lord Jesus, for who you are and all your glory and all your character, even when it comes down to drawing this final line against sin and Satan. Just commit ourselves to you now in Jesus' name. Amen.